everybody, I hope you're all well. Today we are at Pruto Castle. I'm going to do a walk around very shortly. And um, Nikki's taking some photographs. That's what Nikki's doing at the minute. So I hope you all enjoy. Prada Castle is a ruined medieval English castle situated on the south bank of the River Tyne at Prada, Northumberland, England. It is a scheduled ancient monument and a Grade 1 listed building. Archaeological excavations have shown that the first castle on the site was a Norman Mott and Bailey, built sometime in the mid-11th century. Following the Norman conquest, the D'Amfreville family took over control of the castle after it was given to them by Henry I. Robert D'Amfreville was formally granted the barony of Prada by Henry I, but it is likely that the D'Amfrevilles had already been granted Prada in the closing years of the 11th century. The D'Amfrevilles, probably Robert, initially replaced the wooden palisade with a massive rampart of clay and stones and subsequently constructed a stone curtain wall and gatehouse. In 1173 William the Lion of Scotland invaded the northeast to claim the earldom of Northumberland. The head of the D'Umfreville family, Odinal II, refused to support him and as a result the Scottish army tried to take Prada Castle. The attempt failed as the Scots were not prepared to undertake a lengthy siege. The following year, William the Lion of Scotland attacked the castle again but found that Odinal had strengthened the garrison, and after a siege of just three days the Scottish army left. Following the siege, Odinal further improved the defences of the castle by adding a stone keep and a great hall. Odinal died in 1182 and was succeeded by his son Richard. Richard became one of the barons who stood against King John, and as a result forfeited his estates to the crown. They remained forfeited until 1217, the year after King John's death. Richard died in 1226 and was succeeded by his son, Gilbert, who was himself succeeded in 1245 by his son Gilbert. Through his mother, Gilbert II inherited the title of Earl of Angus, with vast estates in Scotland, but he continued to spend some of his time at Prada. It is believed that he carried out further improvements to the castle. Gilbert took part in the fighting between Henry III of England and his barons, and in the Scottish expeditions of Edward I. He died in 1308 and was succeeded by his son, Robert de Umfreville IV. In 1314, Robert was taken prisoner by the Scots at Bannockburn in Scotland, but was soon released, though he was deprived of the earldom of Angus and of his Scottish estates. In 1316 King Edward granted Robert 700 marks to maintain a garrison of 40 men-at-arms and 80 light horsemen at Prada. In 1381 the last of the line, Gilbert III, died without issue and his widow married Henry Percy, 1st Earl of Northumberland. On her death in 1398, the castle passed to the Percy family. The Percys added a new great hall to the castle shortly after they took possession of it. Henry Percy, 1st Earl of Northumberland fought against Henry IV and took part in the Battle of Shrewsbury, 
for which act he was attainted and his estates, including Prada, were forfeited to the crown in 1405. That same year it was granted to the future Duke of Bedford, a son of Henry IV, and stayed in his hands until his death in 1435, whereupon it reverted to the crown. The Perses regained ownership of the Prada estates in 1440, after a prolonged legal battle. Henry Percy, 3rd Earl of Northumberland fought on the Lancastrian side in the Wars of the Roses and was killed at the Battle of Toton in 1461. In 1462 Edward IV granted Prada to his younger brother George, Duke of Clarence. The latter only possessed the castle briefly before the king granted it to Lord Montague. The castle was restored to the fourth earl in 1470. The principal seat of the Perses was Annick Castle and Prudder was for the most part let out to tenants. In 1528 however Henry Percy VI Earl was resident at the castle as later was his brother Sir Thomas Percy. Earl and Sir Thomas were heavily involved in the Pilgrimage of Grace in 1536 and both were convicted of treason and executed. Following forfeiture of the estates the castle was reported in August 1537 to have habitable houses and towers within its walls, although they were said to be somewhat decayed and in need of repairs estimated at £20. The castle was once again restored to Thomas Percy, the seventh earl in about 1557. He was convicted of taking part in the Rising of the North in 1569. He escaped, but was recaptured and was executed in 1572. The castle was thereafter let out to many and various tenants and was not used as a residence after the 1660s. In 1776 it was reported to be ruinous. Between 1808 and 1817, Hugh Percy, 2nd Duke of Northumberland carried out substantial repairs to the ancient fabric and replaced the old dwellings within the walls with a Georgian mansion adjoining the keep. In 1966 the castle was given over to the Crown and is now in the custody of English heritage and is open to the public. The castle stands on a ridge about 150 feet, 46 meters, on the south bank of the River Tyne. It is partly enclosed by a deep moat. The ground to the north falls away steeply to the river. The castle entrance is on the south side and is flanked by a mill pond on the left and a ruined water mill on the right. The castle is entered by a Barbican dating from the first half of the 14th century. The gatehouse, dating from the early 12th century, leads into the outer ward, which contains the remains of several buildings. At the north side, against the curtain wall, are the remains of the Great Hall, measuring 60 feet by 46 feet, 18 meters by 14 meters, built by the Perses when they took over the castle. At 
the end of the 15th century a new hall was built to the west to replace the existing one. On the west side of the outer ward is the manor house, built in the early 19th century, and containing a visitor's shop and exhibition rooms. At the south end of the manor house is a gateway leading into the inner ward. The main feature of the inner ward is the keep, dating from the 12th century. The keep has walls 10 feet, 3.0 meters, thick and its internal dimensions are 20 feet by 24 feet. 7.3 meters by 6.1 meters. It originally consisted of two stories beneath a double-pitched roof. Prada Castle was a civil parish. In 1951 the parish had a population of 1,005. Prada Castle was formerly a township, from 1866 Prada Castle was a civil parish in its own right. Until it was abolished on 1 April 1974 and merged with Prada. A medieval treasure of a fortress, built by the D'Umfreville family between 1100 and 1120 to guard a ford across the River Tyne at Prada. The castle has been in continuous use for over nine centuries. The original castle was besieged on two occasions by Scottish invaders and subsequently strengthened with the addition of a stone keep and great hall. The castle was enlarged in 1300 with the addition of two guard towers. In 1398 the powerful Percy family, earls, later dukes, of Northumberland took over Prada and they added a more sizable Great Hall. Unlike many medieval fortresses, which were allowed to fall into disrepair when their defensive uses faded, Prada was continuously occupied and was refurbished in the Victorian period to produce a comfortable Gothic revival house, occupied by the second Duke of Northumberland's land agent. The castle is now in the hands of English Heritage, who have created displays explaining the long history of the castle, with plenty of hands-on exhibits to entertain visitors young and old. Prada was one of a string of Norman castles erected along the Tyne, beginning shortly after the conquest, around 1095 AD. The first castle was a very simple timber structure, with a traditional Norman motte and bailey arrangement of a wooden palisade atop a high mound, linked to an enclosed area called a bailey. The castle was the administrative centre of a large tract of land known as the Barony of Prada, granted by William the Conqueror to the D'Umfreville family. Then events took a curious twist, for in 1139 King Stephen granted the earldom of Northumberland to the Scottish crown. Many northern nobles, including the D'Umfreville Lords of Prada, attended the Scottish court. Odinal D'Umfreville was actually brought up at the Scottish court, but when Henry II of England reclaimed the earldom in 1151, D'Umfreville sided with his English overlord. 
King William the Lion of Scotland was enraged at D'Umfraville's turn of allegiance, and he attacked Prada in 1173. He was beaten off but returned again in 1174. Once again the Scots were rebuffed, and William was captured after giving up the siege. Interestingly, we know a lot about the first siege, which was witnessed by Jordan Phantosm, clerk to the Bishop of Winchester. Phantosm's account of the conflict gives a vivid portrayal of medieval siege warfare. In the late 13th century Prada housed Scottish prisoners awaiting ransom. Around the same time, the castle defences were strengthened, against the highly likely event of Scottish attack. When the last male heir of the D'Umfraville family died in 1381 the first Earl of Northumberland, Henry Percy, married his widow Matilda, herself one of the largest landowners in the north. Thus the Percy family became the most powerful noble family in the north of England and took over the barony of Prada. The Percys rebelled in 1405 and Henry IV granted the estates to his brother John, Duke of Lancaster. Prada was later attacked and captured by the Yorkist leader Edward IV during the Wars of the Roses, but in an ironic twist, the Percys regained the barony in 1470. The castle passed largely unscathed through the Civil War, but by the late 17th century the Percy family moved their centre of administration to Annick Castle and left Prada in the hands of the Earl's officials. It was later rented out to local farmers and ceased to have any real military function. The large number of public reception rooms shows that this was meant to be a residence for a gentleman, active in society. Designed by Newcastle architect David Stevenson, the early 19th century building incorporates medieval walls from the earlier keep. These original features meld with Regency style, including Egyptian motifs, to create an unusual and refined house. One room of the house is given over to the English Heritage Gift Shop and Ticket Office, while chambers on the first floor host an exhibition on the history of Prada, and an activity area for children. The only entrance to the castle is through a fortified gatehouse, built before 1150. Just down the sloping hill in front of the gatehouse is the ruin of an old mill. Though the ruined building we see now dates from the 18th century, there has been a mill on the site since the medieval period. The mill was owned by the Lord, and all villagers were required to pay the Lord a fee to grind their grain here. On either side of the gatehouse passage are a pair of carved heads, acting as corbels. Over the gatehouse arch, reached by an outside stair, is a small chapel. One striking feature of the chapel is a projecting, oriel window jutting out from the eastern end of the structure. This is thought to be one of the earliest oriel windows in any English castle, perhaps in any English building of any description. At the centre of the inner bailey, reached through the later 19th century house, is the original late 12th century keep built by the D'Umfravilles. You can only access the ground floor of the keep, all else is a roofless shell, though it stands to an impressive height. 
The original Norman entrance was at first floor level, look for the doorway later reused as a window in the 1330s. You can see the stairs built into the thickness of the wall that led up to a wall walk, and a pair of 14th century windows. Most of the public buildings were situated here, including the kitchens, bakehouse, brewhouse, and stables. As well as secondary lodging. You can see remains of two great halls, and a third, the original Norman Hall, is hidden beneath the ground surface. In the 15th century, a new rectangular hall was built, but this was torn down in the 16th century when Prada ceased to be so important to the Percy Lords, and was replaced by a smaller hall. You can see the foundation walls of this smaller building within the outline of the earlier Percy Hall. There is a trail around the outside of the Mott which gives you a very good look at the quite amazingly well-preserved outer walls of the castle, and you can enjoy the later terraced garden reached from the gatehouse walk. One unexpected pleasure is a prehistoric cup and ring marked stone on display in the outer bailey. This was found reused in the foundation of a medieval outbuilding. Prada Castle is located off the A695, head uphill, away from the river, and there is a small parking area, free for visitors. I really enjoyed the castle, it is more impressive than many, more famous medieval fortresses, and has an intriguing history. It is fascinating to see a castle that was not simply left to crumble into ruin but was adapted and used for different purposes throughout its history. Prada Castle was once the undoing of a king. The first castle was built here in about 1095 by Robert de Umfreville as the center of the barony of Prada, and to control a crossing over the River Tyne. But ownership of the border lands between England and Scotland was frequently contested by the two countries, and Prada was dragged into the dispute during sieges in 1173 and 1174. In 1139 King Stephen of England granted the earldoms of Northumberland and Cumberland to David I of Scotland and his son Prince Henry to keep the peace along the border. The Northern English barons often visited the Scottish royal court, and there were marriages between noble families on opposing sides of the border. But Henry II reclaimed the earldoms in 1157, going back on his oath to David I and kicking off generations of conflict. Robert's son, Odinald de Umfreville, had been brought up at the Scottish court, but had married the daughter of the English justiciar and was loyal to Henry. This infuriated the Scottish king, William the Lion, reigned 1165-1214, and when England was thrown into civil war in 1173 and 1174 he twice attacked Prada as part of an attempt to regain the northern counties from Henry II. Jordan Phantosm, clerk to the Bishop of Winchester, witnessed the sieges. In 1173 he tells us that the King of Scotland had his pavilions, his tents, and his marquees pitched there, and his earls and barons assembled. And he said to his noblemen, my lords, what shall we do? As long as Prada stands we shall never have peace. William left to besiege Carlisle Castle and returned the next year with Flemish and French mercenaries swelling his ranks. Odinal had been warned and had stocked up on provisions, and he slipped out to gather reinforcements to lift the siege. William's men destroyed the castle's farms and orchards, but could not take the castle. He left after three days, but on his way to Annick, 
Odinor, and 400 knights with shining helmets and sharp lances caught up with him. William was captured and imprisoned. In return for his release he had to hand over his castles to the English crown, and pay homage to Henry II. Today you can enjoy explore the keep, great hall and the towered walls that now enclose a Georgian mansion. Sometime in the 11th century, Prada Castle was built on the south bank of the River Tyne in the English county of Northumberland. The head of the family, Odinor II, refused to support William the Lion of Scotland's claim to the earldom of Northumberland. The Scottish army attempted to take the castle, but the attempt failed. William tries to retake the castle but leaves after a failed siege of three days. The keep is located at the centre of the Inner Bailey and is still standing today. However, only the ground floor is accessible, and the roof is no longer visible. As the original Norman entrance was located on the first floor, the doorway can still be seen. This doorway was reproposed into a window in the 1330s. The original Great Hall is no longer visible, though it's hidden beneath the ground. Odinor II died, and the castle passed to his son, Richard. Richard stood against King John, leading to his properties and estates being forfeited to the crown. His estates were returned in 1217, following King John's death in 1216. Richard died, and the castle passed to his son Gilbert. Gilbert died, and the castle passed to his son Gilbert II. Alright everybody, that is the end of the video. I hope you all enjoyed. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and comment and any suggestions for any place was go would be very helpful. And thank you all for watching. See you all soon. Bye everyone!